welcome. I'm Masood Raja, and in this brief lecture in my series on nationalism, I'll be talking about the fun functionalist definition of nationalism as offered by Carl Dusch. And he starts his description of the people or nations by, and I quote, the community which permits a common history to be experienced as common is a community of complementary habits and facilities of communication. Right, so that's where he starts. But then he says, in order to facilitate that communication, it needs, you know, it requires a tool, right? Uh, and what does it require? It requires something to stay, st store the information, to recall it, to transmit it, to recombine it, and to reapply it. This is the apparatus that a community needs to become an effective community of complementary habits. And when a community or a group accomplishes that, then, according to him, a larger group of persons linked by such complementary habits and facilities of communication we may call a people. So the first stage is when a certain number of people or a group of people accomplish a mode of communication which allows them to transmit, exchange, record, recover information together as a group, they become a people. Uh, the test of this complementarity he suggests is that uh, is how fast and how accurately can a message get through within a community, right? So that means the community must also have commun communicative efficiency, right? So a people come together because they have an effective system of communication but the test of that communication is how fast can it be delivered, understood, disseminated, and that that communicative efficiency is absolutely necessary in constituting these people. So what constitutes all this, right? Socially standardized system of symbols, maybe a language, right? Um, any other codes, alphabets, systems of writing, painting, calculating, all of these form a part of a calculating system. Cultural memories, history. So overall, what he's then describing is that what we usually call a culture, right, is a culture of a people because within it, efficient communication, its understanding, dissemination, retrieval, rearticulation is possible. That's why we started with that this is a very functionalist definition of nations and peoples. Then he goes on to uh, actually describe what he means by the functionalist definition of nationality. And he says, membership in a people essentially consists in wide complementarity of social communication. It consists in the ability to communicate more effectively and over a wider range of subjects with members of one large group than with outsiders. So still, what constitutes a people is the efficacy and efficiency of internal communication, which by and large tends to be better than people from another nation. So that's the beginning of it. This is what he also calls then the ethnic complementarity. Ethnic in a sense that there will always be a larger group that shares a code, shares a culture, modes of retrieval, modes of articulation, and that in compares to another group, this group has a more nuanced, right, but more functional system of exchange of communications. And that's when they become, and it's not subjective, it's given to members of the group because they are member of that group, and that's what makes them a nation, right? 
Then moving on, uh, and it requires a certain alignment, right? And 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 since he mentions complementarity, then he goes on to suggest, okay, what are different ways of achieving this complementarity? The uh, is complementarity of acquired social and economic preferences that they should have some sort of social and economic code or loose system that they all become a part of. Then rise of industrialism everywhere and capitalism also creates these communicational environments in which large groups can align themselves with each other. So what does then nationality do, right? Because when people have all these elements of complementarity, they aspire to be a nation. And he says vast numbers have felt a need for such a group and have answered it by putting their trust in their nation after the nation comes to be. Nationality then, he says, means an alignment of large number of individuals from the middle and lower classes linked to regional centers and leading social groups by channels of social communication and economic intercourse, both indirectly from link to link and directly with the center. So that's his definition of nationality, that it's groups of people linked together in one communicational network to a regional center and then ultimately to a larger center, right? And within that, he also points out that there always emerges a dominant group, right? And this dominant group establishes its communicational hegemony so that others want to be a part of it, right? But largely, there could be regional groups, but they will have to share communication with each other, but must also have the capacity to effectively communicate to whatever they consider a center, and that is when a people become a nation and have developed a nationality. Once a nationality has added his power to compel to its earlier cohesiveness and attachment to group symbols, it often considers itself a nation and is so considered by others. So after they have had this communication, this cohesiveness, they have developed these alliances, but when they develop a mode of enforcing, coercing maybe, but encouraging this cohesiveness, then they have moved into politics, right? And that's when a nationality which could exist in an objective form becomes a nation, right? So he's tracing how does a basic community come to be through communication and effectiveness of communication and complementarity of communication? How do they move to become a people, right? Then develop a nationality and then become a nation. And once they have become a nation, nationalities turn into nations. And when they acquire power to back up their aspirations, they become nations. Finally, if their nationalistic members are successful, and a new or old state organization is put into their service, then at last the nation has become sovereign and a nation state has come into being. So throughout, as I explained, this uh, Carl Duish's functionalist definition, it depends on communication, but a communication system and a certain degree of complementarity where I understand what you say, you understand what I say, and based on that complementarity, then larger communicational system, economic system develops. And that's when people can understand each other, can communicate with each other in opposition to other people. And when they do that, they become a nationality. When someone emerges or a group emerges that starts proposing that because these regional centers are in complementarity with the center, and that if they come together and can express their will together 
through communication, but through also a social system that they share, linguistic system that they share, economic system that they share, then they become a nation. And then within that, after they have become a nation, if they develop a politics or a movement which encourages them to either wrest a territory or the status of an autonomous nation or institute an autonomous nation with its own government and all, then they would have become a nation state. This briefly, I don't know, I'm, not, I, I'm sure I've not done a good job of it, is the functionalist definition of nationalism and nation states and nationality by Carl Dewish. I will post a link to his book in the description, which I highly encourage you read. I actually used him in my first book when I, because I was trying to use the functionalist definition of the nation, and I hope this was useful to you. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, and if you like this series or everything else on this channel, please do subscribe. Thank you so much, and peace and love.